All right, I am here with my uh, dear brother, Dr. Matthew Meidard. We're going to be talking about a brand new book that he put together that barely came out, Made by God, Made for God, which is really a fantastic book. And I'm just really thrilled to be here with you today, Dr. Meidard. Dr. Meidard, um, tell the audience a little bit about yourself uh, before we dig in. I know they've seen you a lot um, on uh, Reason of Theology, where I also co-host. Now they're going to be seeing you in my channel where, um, believe it or not, I talk about you a lot. And I talk about the incredible work you're doing. And I talked about this book not long back. The audience are really excited for this show. So really, what, what do you do, Dr. Minard? And um, what brought about the inspiration for this book? Yeah, well, thank you, William, for having me on. You know, actually, you were the start of my online time. <laughs> because uh, I was whenever we I think got on to talk about Palamas or something. Uh, I was on correct. recent theology, so yep. and I always hear about I always hear about you from Father Christian, from my boss. So <laughs> you know, uh, it's just great to be on here, and we have these wonderful little text messages back and forth. So it's just wonderful to be now here back in the studio with you, so to speak, the digital studio. Oh, really? um, so just a little bit about me, uh, because some might be coming in here and have not seen my my endless prattling on recent theology, and even over there I've become kind of old hat. Um, so I live in uh, southwestern Pennsylvania. I'm a professor of philosophy and moral theology at the Byzantine Catholic Seminary uh, in Pittsburgh. And I, th I think maybe a little later it'll be appropriate. We can maybe even take up just a teeny bit uh, about the, the Byzantine Church or churches, really, and the Ruthenian Church, uh, of which I'm a member. But I teach there... Uh, our sequence of courses in moral theology, our bit of philosophy, our pre-theology idea is a little bit different in the Eastern Catholic churches. We don't have as rigorous or detailed of a philosophy program, but I teach our philosophy courses and a little bit of uh, Catholic intellectual history in the 20th century. And then I do get to occasionally do my own electives online, especially. Uh, there's not a lot of room for priestly electives because they have so many courses and so much formation to do. Right. But of course the audience probably, I mean, they're they're well apprised, right? Patristic pillars, so they're going to be in touch with the Orthodox world and even the Eastern Catholic world. But the Ruthenian Catholic world is so small that no one mentions us among the Slavic churches. It's always the Ukrainians, right? Um, but that, that also indicates it's a small seminary. Uh, we, we teach uh, Ruthenian Catholics and Melkite Catholics, right? The Arab Catholics who are yeah. um, descended from the Antiochian Orthodox and very closely related to the Antiochian Orthodox Church even today. Um, so we primarily do their formation, then occasionally some things for the Romanians and Ukrainians, but we're small. So I live a kind of two-hatted two life. And so the other hat uh, that I have is my work. Um, and I ask my wife sometimes if I if I self sell too much, but it's the the wall behind me, which is going to be filled with some more things too. I, I do uh, a good bit of translation of French scholastics, writing either in French or um, Latin. And so my first works were related to the, to the Dominican who taught at the Angelicum in the um, uh, for the whole first half of the 20th century, Father Reginald Gary Lagrange. But I also have coming out, it's like trying to get my finger to go the right way. Uh, a beautiful book. In some ways, the, the inspiration for the text that I ended up writing, Father Ambrose Garday's The True Christian Life. And then I have an endless sequence below that's Father Jean Hervé Nicolas' dogmatics text, a huge 2000 page volume. But we at CUA Press are breaking it apart into multiple volumes. And some other projects too. I've got a, a volume on the Nouvelle Theologie and some essays on it. So I do this work as a translator and then an academic translator, adding annotations, gathering together articles, commenting on them, all of that uh, sort of thing. Now, now I know my, my, that's, my, my, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's very my, different than what I'm doing here, but go ahead yeah, and, and. I, I know the audience are gonna, are gonna get really upset if I don't do this. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask, any idea when any of those will be available for people to, uh, oh. to get a hold of? Yeah. So, and of course, they're going to be a different tone than than Made by God, Made for God, yeah. which is a popular book. So just Ascension Press wants me to make sure that I don't sound like too much of a professor, and I <laughs> promise that I won't. But yeah, we have coming out, um, the Garde volume comes out at the very beginning of 2022. I just yeah. sent back my copy edits or my my proof edits. I, um, I started to just do the indexing. Uh, the Nicola starts sometime later this year, it's a fall release. And then it's gonna have over basically one volume a year, I think is how they're gonna space out the other content. So I'm waiting for copy edits on the Christology section. And there's a very long ecclesiology wow. and sacrament section. Um, and then there's another Garagu book coming out at the very end of this year or very beginning of uh, 2022, depending on the printer 
Um, that's his work on divine revelation, uh, probably around, you know, 1200 pages or so. Wow. So, uh, yeah, that's a big, that's one that like broke my back a little bit. Um, the Nouvelle Theology thing is being sent in. It's been accepted, but that's academic publication takes eons. So, but right. then why do the popular thing, right? What is this text? So this is a fun, it's a fun story actually. Um, cause it's, it's like the, the story our Lord tells about the, the insist, the insistent widow or the, the, you know, the, or the, even just the insistence in prayer, right? Uh, if you keep, keep knocking and asking for a cup, uh, you know, a cup of a cup of flour or whatever. I, uh, you know, even we know to answer that, let alone our Lord. But Father Deacon John Harden, uh, and that's how we re refer to deacons in the Eastern Church. Um, uh, Father Deacon Harden was at the time just uh, John Harden, and he had taken a moral theology class with me in the summer in our deacon formation program. And you know, we get done with class, and he kind of appropriately comes up to me. He says, "I know we still have things to be graded, but here's my business card. I work for Ascension Press. Um, you know, if you ever want to be in touch, you know, we maybe you know to, to write a moral theology book." And I thought, "Okay, what you know, whatever. I've I've met you for a week. You know, I have to ignore this. I actually have to set this out of consideration so that nothing can ever be accused whenever I'm grading your work. So, okay." Well, then he keeps hounding me and he wanted me to write a popular book that, that took the content of my course, which I've found that both at the seminary and also for our deacons at the seminary, that I've had to really patch together this, this mixed synthesis of East and West, but even, to be honest, a synthesis of a total introduction to moral theology that works for our students, because there aren't a lot of just general textbooks. And so... He had an idea for the text, and we, we didn't agree. He came back to me about a year later, and I, I just said, I'm, I, I think we have artistic differences. Okay. Well, he, he then came back to me yet again, uh, maybe nine months later or so, and they, they really gave me a great deal of latitude to, to write a book that tries to emphasize the, the grandeur of the Christian vocation as a vocation to divinization yep. and to understand how living the divine life is the way to understand the whole total moral vocation of the Christian life and then all the connections of the moral life to the spiritual life and not merely a, a kind of introduction to right and wrong, even though I'm not, of course, against objective norms. Um, and so it was a great, it was actually a great fun and maybe helped me get through co the COVID season because uh, my wife and I were very blessed to be able to work at home. So we spent a ton of time, though, just at home from the time that everything started in March all the way through, really, the I mean, the whole whole of that second, the beginning of the second wave and into Christmas even. And so last summer, last spring and summer, I started putting together the notes and then I would write the chapters, you know, one by one, edit them, take them to my wife, would go for a walk with the girls. Uh, I would read them, read the chapter out loud, uh, go back with some of her thoughts, you know, and then keep moving along. And it was great to write a book that just breaks down the idea of the life of grace, the sacraments and the sanctification. Yes, sin, but the virtues, the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, the idea of Christian moral virtue. And so to talk about Christian prudence or Christian conscience and justice and courage and fortitude in a way that's just these little vignettes about different aspects of each one and to do it without technicality, yeah. to do it without the professorial hat, right? Influenced by all of my professorialness. Um, I forget there are how many footnotes. It's not, I could come up with a lot more footnotes than, than this, uh, just because it's the temptation. You know it as a writer that you want to put footnotes yep. of everything. Uh, oh, yeah. But, you know, it still has 223 footnotes, you know, so it's got the academic stuff in the end notes, but it's not academic. It's, it's meant to be a mixture of spiritual meditation, moral spiritual meditation, um, and teaching that, that, that is accessible to, um, you know, the faithful lay. All yeah. I presuppose is that you want to know something about your vocation as a Christian, your vocation in being configured to Christ and ultimately configured to the Holy Trinity and living the eternal life of heaven now in the life of grace. And, and as long as you're interested in that, the book's written, written for you. And I, I hope that it functions both as a useful meditation for those who are, you know, more intellectuals, yes, but primarily to be accessible to those who have no theological formation, very carefully written to not be technical. So, And I think you have really found that perfect balance in the book. 
Uh, it's a really fantastic book. And I think you, you set out to make it a point that you wanted it to be very accessible to people to be able to read it, to be able to digest it well, and yet for it to make a lasting impact on them. And I think you begin very, you know, very well in the beginning, chapter one, you lay out a very clear case for what moral theology is. Now, you know, we, we hear that term, you know, tossed out every now and then, but a lot of people don't really meditate upon it. Can you briefly tell the audience what exactly is that and why is that important to us really as Christians? Yeah, and I'm I'm throughout going to be reflecting perhaps a particular vocabulary that I don't need to cite, you know what I mean, yeah. right? This is a developed position that I've gotten from a certain vein of theologians, but I think it's right as well, and I think it's conformed to the tradition. You know, let's even look at the words, actually. I think that that works, right? We look at moral theology, and here's what we tend to think, the science of right and wrong. And maybe we tend to think it's the science of the divine commandments. You know, what is it that God has commanded? And listen, the universal catechism as well as, you know, the universal catechism that came out of the Western church in Trent, very much modeled on the, on the commandments. The language of revelation is law and commandments. So I'm not poo pooing that, but that idea of moral theology tends to see it as this little branch of Christianity that tells you some of the rules that you, you shouldn't transgress. These are the limits you can't go beyond. Um, so that's a way of, of treating it like the, you know, moral law, uh, Sometimes people think of moral theology, I think, as, as a kind of souped up Christian moral philosophy. That's a real problem, too. Um, but the two words play off of each other, interestingly. And you have to ask yourself, well, what's the noun doing? What's theology doing here, right? Well, because if you don't understand the, the noun, you're not going to understand what you're modifying. And you're not going to understand, then, the meaning of moral theology within theology. The ancient idea of theology, you know... Uh, as kind of dividing up our study of God. There's the study of God and the study of his, his economy of salvation, salvation history. So there's the theology and the economy. The most profound sense though of theology, no matter what you want to take it as, as a discipline, is the study of God's inner life and the mystery he has revealed to us through the gift of faith. Theology is the, you know, the study of God, yes, but we should say the faith-filled meditation on the great mystery of the triune life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, revealed to us in Christ and to which we are being led back through the economy of salvation. And so we have theology spills out into the economy of salvation in Christ and leads back to the divine life of God himself, the inner life of the Trinity. But of course, there are many things that we study in theology in our schools that's not that are not just the Trinity, right? We study yep. Christology, the study of the incarnation, right? And that was the great arguments of the early church were centered on wh who is Christ, because of course that ultimately reveals well who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, but you know, we study the nature of the church, we study the nature of the sacraments, we study Our Lady, so we under want to understand Mariology. Um, we study the last things. Uh, we study the theology of creation. But all of these are, we could say, subsidiary mysteries that are part of the, the overall tale of God's divine life, either in itself, in the Trinity, or as communicated. So just to give an example, the profound meaning of the incarnation is ultimately the triune processions, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trinity is at the center of all theology and it draws all of these other disciplines to themselves. We study the church because the church is the mystical body of Christ into whom we are incorporated through baptism so that we may be led back to the, the life of uh, the, the life of God himself given to us. Now, there we have it. Therefore, moral theology is that portion of theology, but it's not some other part that's over here. It's the necessary part of understanding the mysteries of faith. That portion of theology that understands or strives to give some understanding of the mystery of God reflected in us through grace. Yeah. And if you see moral theology in that light, everything else kind of follows, right? There's God in oh, himself yeah. reflected in us through the incorporation into Christ. And all of that gift of grace radiates out throughout all the virtues. It's adored by 
And I apologize. I noticed a teeny bit of technology issue on my side. I don't know if it's coming yeah, up. You're, with you. you're, you're good now. Uh, when it, you did have a little bit of crack up there, but we could hear the audio perfectly. The video froze a little bit. You're good. You're good oh, now. Okay. Yeah. So th you see then that moral theology is just that theology that views the Trinitarian God reflected in humanity. Yeah. And that's, pr but the profound sense of reflected. The, the being incorporated and changed and divinized through grace not only at the substance of our, our soul, but in all of our activities. Yeah, that, that's, right? that's fantastic. And I think you really laid it out very clearly. And that's the one, the one thing that I think, I don't think I know your book is going to fill a much needed um, area, you know, for the faithful to be able to have something accessible that has, you know, has this broken down and, and I don't mean this in, in, in a, this is not a negative thing when I say that you've written it in, in everyday language. I think that was your goal to do that, mm -hmm. to write it. Yeah. But then again, the, the flip side for me when I'm looking at it is that the everyday person can read it, get a lot out of it. But then you can even have the person who really wants to read the meaty scholarly stuff, get a lot out of it, get a lot out of the footnotes as well. So I think it's a book written for everyone. Really, you know, it's it's really, really well written. And um, it, it brings me to my next question to you. You have a very good night. I really enjoyed it. I, I really dug in quite a bit to the, your fifth chapter in the book. It talks about continuous conversion. And you don't really hear this a whole lot nowadays, especially within Catholicism, but you should. And I'm wondering, when we hear of that, when you, we hear continuous conversion as you cover that in your fifth chapter is this the same thing as growing in holiness justification may perhaps like in our walk of faith or what exactly what does continuous conversion mean yeah and this i mean it's it is deeply influenced by my reading as a thomist but there's a sense in which it's also this this byzantine sense of the transcendence of god that ultimately grace renders us in the the likeness of God supernaturally and that our faith and our hope and our love are participations in God's knowledge and God's own self-love as well as God's love for his creation his supernatural love that draws all things to Christ right and that is so high of a vocation our end our goal our life the meaning of our life is so immensely divine that no human act is ever going to really be able to fully you know imbibe the transcendence of that calling right and that doesn't mean that we should give up rather it shows that the perfection of charity requires us to forever grow in in the life of of god that has given to us through grace you could say grow in virtue that's fine but we want to make this as divine sounding as possible each and every day we should launch forth more deeply into the very depths of God lived in our particular context. Have I today made present to my children and my wife in some more profound way the reflection of the Father upon Christ's face, communicating the Spirit in a way that comes across in my justice, my you know, fulfilling my duties as a father? in my my fraternal charity which i discuss you know in the book right yep. but this means that we are forever looking to purify down into the depths and root slumber in the depths of all that old Adam is always left over the remnants of the old man that christ is looking to be to be impressed upon more and more that we are being incorporated more deeply and, and rooting out all the effects of the fall, but not merely being justified, being snatched from being the, the old Adam, but also too that we, we actually have the, the radiation, the shining of the, the divine light through each of our acts. Like these little points, every human act should be this new supernatural reflection of the divine life. This is why the, the transfiguration became such an important theme in certain mystics right that you yeah. see that the life of grace is this participation and radiation like our lord says about being salt and light that irradiates the light of the face of christ in all of our acts and you can't shine a light that's as bright as god anywhere equal to it in any creature 
but you know what he's he's striving to do that nonetheless in us and so it just pushes us you know in this great impulse of of divine love that 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 drives our life from here until the the end of our life so of course life will be one big con continual conversion so yes that means it's you know continual um I mean, it's walk with Christ. That's in some ways better. Um, it's sanctification, but it's sanctification not merely, you know, uh, you know, in a kind of following the rule sense. It's really a question of have you purified that that gift of charity that has been given to you of all the virtue of all the supernatural virtues. But, you know, ultimately, our perfection is found in love. The one thing that I really, uh, really get, you know, really appreciated from the book, uh, Dr. Minard is the incredible amount of scripture that you have in there and early church father material. You, you really did your homework and, um, you know, you can really tell that the book was, you know, definitely a labor of love. It is jam packed with scripture where, you know, my, my what I talk about when it comes to continuous conversion, you, you speak about it, you, you lay it out there very clearly that this is put forth in the Bible. And indeed, as you talk about this being a walk to the end of one's life, it reminds me of the, of the words of the great, um, the great Saint Paul, who puts forth that imagery in one Corinthians chapter nine. He he puts it forth actually uh, uh, in a different kind of manner, compares it to kind of like a uh, a marathon race that one must run. Yeah, you know, I know you're very mm -hmm. familiar with that chapter, and he's very clear. He's, you know, you must endure that in order to get that crown of victory to the very end. So I really, I think people, and I want to emphasize because the, the audience, much like over at Reason of Theology, we have a heavy, heavy Eastern audience there as well. So I think Eastern Christians that are tuning in will get a lot out of the book, but I also have a lot of moderators on my channel. I love them. They're, they're great. They're great that are evangelical. And I think they will also get a lot from this book as well because you utilize a lot of sacred scripture. And I think at the heart of it, that really is something that maybe people, maybe a lot of books don't really have a whole lot of that, but you provide a, a, a ton of that. And I think it, talk, it touches upon the minds of even evangelicals that would be able to appreciate this book as well. I think that's a good observation. I mean, not just because it's a positive one, uh, because I really wanted to make the, the text be be rooted, yes, in the fathers, but above all in sacred scripture, right? Yeah. This is one of the things like at the Second Vatican Council, there was in Optatum Todius, a real emphasis that moral theology needed to draw more fully and explicitly from sacred scripture. So I just thought, you know, I can't go through and annotate the whole Old Testament, but I did do a prayerful reading as part of my prep for this of the of the New Testament. And it was, you know, it wasn't Alexio, it wasn't full Lexio Divina, which would take forever, right? But it was a prayerful reading. And I made I made actually a whole database as well to make sure wow. that I that it would bring themes back to me. Right. There are parts of the I was a monk for three years. So there's part of the the having been a monk and doing Lexio all the time as a monk, that you then start getting like you hear a word, it reminds you of another scripture verse, and you kind of jump along. Um, you know, and so that that then is activated because of that process. Um but I wanted to avoid turning this book into, let's be honest, Thomism. I'm right. most I'm most fully trained in in late Thomism, uh, and many good to that. But the church does not require everyone in the church to be Thomists, and sure. the call to holiness is not a is not a Thomist truth. It is the universal patrimony right. of of our faith. And so I thought, well, why would you not turn to our Lord's words, right? Why would you not turn to Saint Paul? Like you bring this up where that Corinthians verse, first Corinthians nine verse is cited. And yep. then, then, you know, I have a jump to section from Luke about taking up a cross daily, Colossians, second Timothy, Philippians, first Corinthians, you know, uh, and then something else from first, first Corinthians and Romans on the page before, right? The great master of the spiritual life is Christ, St. Paul, Christ and St. Paul. You can't, you know, you can, you, there's so many things in St. Paul, but you can't help but read the Pauline corpus without thinking, this is the rich source for, yep. for meditating on, on our life. And it's revealed. So why not go to the font and draw it from there? You know, And might I make to our Protestant brethren one more observation that I've not shared publicly. And I don't know how, the, how some, some listeners will, but your listeners are very ecumenical and kind. The, books, the book is actually dedicated to an evangelical Protestant. Wow. Yeah, an old, wow. an old in my hometown. 
my babysitter growing up. Um, wow. And, and like the local matron, she watched, you know, she, she watched like eight or nine of us in the community while her husband worked at the, the steel plant. Um, and I thought, you know, I've dedicated so many translations to dead people. And I owe a lot of my early Christian formation to her. You know, it would be the summer and we would be there, all eight or nine kids. And, you know, the parents were, I was Catholic and you had, you know, whatever other mix. But Shirley took us to, you know, Bible school in the summer. And they were a very faithful uh, evangelical uh, school or uh, school, Bible school at church, you know. And, and so I probably picked up some of my love of scripture so young from her. Yeah. And I just think that the simple non-ostentatious living of the Christian life that, that, you know, not, you're, you're not trying to live the life you just are. You're not trying to, to be something is what, that's what I, I find in her. And, you know, I don't, I don't see her a ton because I don't live down in my hometown, but it's not far away. Um, and it was so meaningful for me to take that book to her. And, you know, I mean, wow. just her, her, she was originally from West Virginia. You know, she just gets up in that big West Virginia, you know, Brewston Mills embrace. And so when I'm writing it, and I know I'm going to dedicate it to her. I'm like, you know, I'm going to write it to Catholics and it's written for Catholics and I'm not going to yeah. flex from the truths of the Catholic faith. Of but course. when it comes to the scripture use, I think, you know, I hope that, you know, Shirley appreciates all this use of, of scripture here. And so that's that's fantastic. And that, 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 that is a great, great, great touching tribute to her. I mean, that's that's wonderful to hear. Chapter 11 um, and, and people may be wondering why I'm hopping to different ones. The book, you've got to read it yourself. There's a lot that you can gather out of the book, a lot you can get out of it. I'm touching upon particular areas that really stuck out to me, but I want the audience to know there are a lot, a lot. We would be, have to do multiple shows. So I'm, I'm picking certain ones. And chapter 11, I thought, was beautifully laid out. It particularly, I love anything that talks about the sacraments. You write something that I found so profound and touching. Can you perhaps maybe touch upon what it means? You wrote, the sacraments are not just external rituals. They are the acts of Christ, alive and acting through his body today. And the reason I'd like you to touch upon that is because a lot of people maybe go into the motion, say they don't stop and meditate and pray on it. And they may really look at them as external rituals and not realize the truth of the word of, of the words that you've put forth here. What really, what is, what is, what do you mean when you say they are the acts of Christ living and active through his body? Cause I was really touched by those words there. Yeah. So th there is a theme that develops in the early church about the idea that Christ's humanity is, is kind of like the instrument of his divinity. It's the means by which the word becomes incarnately present. And this is, it, it, it actually, I think it's Damascene, uh, John Damascene, where that's worked out. Well, just as his humanity is his, his instrument, the sacraments are just the continued mystical presence of his activity in his mystical body throughout the rest of history, right? That Christ in the ascension may not be physically present, but now he is present through the spirit as incorporating all of humanity into himself, into his mystical body. And that's real. That's a realism. It's not just the spiritual thing inside of our souls. Christ is active for all the rest of the final age. We've entered the final age. History is now in its final age. The cross is the, the cross, death, resurrection, ascension, beginning. And so just as Christ's humanity was his conjoined instrument, it was the immediate instrument directly connected to the word through the hypostatic union, as we say in dogmatic theology, the sacraments are these remote means by which he acts through his ministers throughout the rest of, of this age of salvation. And so that means, and this is what's important, why in a moral theology book, right? There's a temptation to think the sacraments are, you know, we've got to follow the rules of the sacraments and there's beautiful mystagogy about the sacraments, um, but it's kind of over here. It's separate from moral theology. Every grace you ever receive either is leading you up to baptism or flows from your baptismal character, Yeah. right? Oh yeah. That means that the profound mystery of who we are as children of God is marked by that rebirth through baptism. 
right? And then it's reflected throughout all of the other sacraments in various ways, through the full outpouring of the Spirit that brings your baptism, in a sense, to its completion. I mean, that's maybe more of an Eastern way of, of thinking here, right? Because we connect them so closely together. Chrismation or confirmation, the continued you know, substantial presence of the food for wayfarers and the sacrifice that is the source of, of all, all grace in the end, the whole meaning of all history, the cross, death, and resurrection of Christ in the Eucharist, configuring our suffering to Christ in a unique way uh, through sickness in, in the anointing of the sick, you know, the deputing of you know, external, the, the external affairs of the church, the domestic church for the family, to be divinized as parents. Your relationship as married spouses is marked with this new reflection of God's grace, which becomes the source of, we could say, parental virtue, yes, mm -hmm. but parental divinization. So, I mean, a kind of technical sounding thing, but being made divine as parents through the sacrament of matrimony. Or also the, the configuration to Christ as priest in the three, the three degrees of orders. Yep. And there's one sacrament in there. I forgot, I think. I think I only did six. Um, that'll suffice. That'll suffice though. Sorry. I just, <laughs> but the point, because the point is being that in the activity, uh, of the sac, uh, in the activity of the sacraments, Christ is operative right now. Yeah. Placing the light of divine grace in the depths of our soul. And so, you know, the, the whole mystagogy of baptism becomes actually the mystagogy of beatitude, divine rebirth what the Eastern church would call theosis, the beginning of our divinization, our being made divine, right? The sacraments are central moments in the whole meaning of what grace means, actually. And here's why, if I might finish, because I've, I've said it implicitly, but I, I probably should be explicit. Because to understand grace aright, grace is not merely just, you know, this individual thing that I get, right? And it makes me, you know, a divine, a, you know, divinized person, a better person, a true son of God, a true daughter of God, however we want to talk about it, right? Grace is not merely that. Grace incorporates us into the very mystery of the incarnation, into the mystery of the mystical body of Christ. We become members of each other because our grace that we all receive is nothing more than just like a waterfall that comes down from Christ's own grace as the head of the church. Yeah. And this, this develops in Western theology, this idea that the union of the word with the human nature in Christ spills down through the human nature, not only about Christ's holiness. It's not just about Christ being the most holy, right? But no, no, no. He is the you know, divine human man into whom we become mystically incorporated because he is the head of the body of the church. So there's all these interconnections between our life in the virtues, our life fulfilling our role as a child of God, and ultimately the very mystery of salvation itself shown in, in the incarnation, that we are being incorporated into the mystical body of Christ. And the activity of that mystical body is most directly um, manifest in Christ's own activity, the divine act of Christ through the sacraments. So that, that that's fantastic, really fantastic the way the way all of it is just so connected and it brings me to my next question to you, and it's it's incredible how all this is just so, you know, so interwoven, so tightly knit together. And you 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 bring out clearly in chapter nineteen, and I particularly liked it because anytime I read a book and they utilize a Deuterocanon, I'm just you know I you know brings a <laughs> smile brings a smile on my face because I it's an, it's an area where. Kind of like uh, kind of like Mariology, I've done a ton of work in the Deuterocanon. canon. Uh, I do a lot of work with a, a, a very good friend, a mutual friend of my, myself and Father Kopp is uh, Gary Machuda, who is just magnificent when it comes to the Deuterocanon. canon. And in chapter 19, you talk about the family life and you bring up a, what I've always considered to be a beautiful passage from Sirach, or also known as Ecclesiasticus, chapter three, three to four. I'll go ahead and read it for the audience. It says, whoever honors his father, atones for sins whoever glorifies his mother is like one who lays up treasure and the words utilized there funny enough people people might not realize this but early on before you know when he first began protesting 
Luther had no issue with uh, with the Book of Sirach. It would be as time would progress and his uh, his protestations would grow even stronger. But that's a topic for a whole other show, a whole other day. But uh, but maybe can we touch upon what is being said here, Doctor Minard? Uh, can we perhaps talk about this briefly? What is the chief message that we can gather from this quote and from really chapter 19 as a whole where you speak about the family life? Because in my opinion, it really touched me because that really is such a incredibly important central part of living your life as a Christian devoted to Christ. Yeah, it's it's so tempting you see this in in just different theories of moral life the moral life moral philosophy it's tempting to think about how can i do the most good for the most people in some form right like how can i have the biggest impact right except christ didn't ask us first to to be world shakers but to be faithful in the place that providence has placed us and where is the very first place providence has placed us it's been in it's in the family now there's a sense in which this chapter is, it's in a section of talking about various virtues of justice, right? So I'm talking about the ancient idea of filial piety, recognizing your parents and recognizing the infinite debt you owe to them. But it's something more too, because the Christian is aware of the fact that providence has placed you within, let's say, especially in the case of a Christian household, that's just to take that as the, the kind of norm, even though we could apply this to all sorts of situations placed you within a domestic church the the place of grace where the life of the life that god has been giving to you from the moment of your conception has been unfolding with your parents who are the stewards of god's salvific plan for you you know that's the profound meaning of being a parent is that you are tied up with the very destiny of a person that that is attached to the providential decree that god has for, for this, this child of yours. Um, and so, well, then the, the, the first level of duties ties in, think about the 10 commandments, right? The first positive commandment, right? Uh, you know, with, or I shouldn't say the first positive commandments, the last of the positive commandments, the one with a, a blessing and a curse attached to it is to honor your parents, right? Well, okay, yeah, honor your parents because you owe, owe your existence to them. That's what the reader of Aristotle would say. <laughs> but honor your parents because they are the locus of this co-creativity with God. And then there's a flip side to it as well. Parents, that's how you live the sacramental grace of matrimony. Are you, are you making your household the, the place of the formation of saints or not? And that doesn't mean little French prayer cards, right? These little pallid prayer cards that my wife, God bless her, she loves them, but I, I just don't like these Italianate French prayer cards. Um, what it really means is you are stewarding the light of Christ that has been given to these children. And are you actually making everything in the household, you know, wrap around that? And there's a whole dance that's Christian prudence. You have to figure out what that means for you in your community, related to your own families, etc., your context. But ultimately, this great mystery of the church is lived out in the domestic church. Yeah. And so it becomes the place where righteousness is born. And so you see here actually the connection. And I'm not forcing this, you know, it's just sort of coming to my, my adult mind, the connection between the sacramental grace of matrimony, and then we can keep going backwards, right? Incorporation into Christ, and ultimately the leading us back to the the divine life that we are we are living, the Trinitarian reflection that is playing out in our being good children and our being, you know, truly, I mean, divine children of our earthly parents, uh, and also too stewards of the divine life as parents. So may I make just another observation? This is why, yes, bioethics is important. And I teach a bioethics course, right? But, you know, dealing with what to do at the end of life, and it's necessary. I've had to do this a couple of times. Both of my parents are dead and I had to care for them. So I'm not insensitive to this. So I don't want any listener to think I'm being flippant. I mean, I've, I've had to do that for them and for especially one of my grandparents who I cared for at the end of her life. Um, that being said, that's only the beginning question of how to deal with some of those hard decisions at the end of life. Because yeah. really the, the profound thing at the end of, uh, end of life is, you know, how is it that you as a child are part of your parents' preparation 
for you know the the, the final meeting of our Lord, like the deep meaning uh, of of that relationship plays out there. You know, I mean, the most beautiful thing would be I and I hope I hope I'm not just in an addled and angry state of the world, which would be my besetting fault. Um, I hope that you know I can. My my dream would be to pray the liturgy of the hours with both my children and perhaps a few of the, the last living monastic brethren of mine from once upon a time, you know, uh, who were my family as well for, for three important years of my life at the, you know, at my, my dying bedside, it would be, you know, an utterly beautiful way to, to sing the divine praises at the end of life. And that's the, the profound meaning of the virtuous life lived in the family on the part of children, on the part of uh, parents, the domestic church. That and that, that is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful um, reflection there, Dr. Minard. As we, uh, as we come to a close here though, I would like for, um, can you, you know, maybe put in a plug or plug or two of whatever else you, you want to talk about the, the Byzantine uh, um, seminary where you work at, you want to talk about anything else you may be working on, you know, anything, you want to put a plug on, but if you can also, and I'll put it right down there for the audience, you also let them know where can they get a hold of this incredible book. It's good because I do have to make sure I get my appropriate plugs <laughs> in because the press gives me my details, right? You go yeah, to, go right. to uh, ascensionpress.com slash Catholic morality uh, is where the book uh, can be gotten with other really wonderful products there as well from Ascension. Um but what am I working on? It's like being overwhelmed. I have a book, actually, some interesting, a little bit dry stuff on conscience uh, that I'm working on with Clooney Press. You know, they do a lot of republication, but they have a Thomas series. Um, so I have a, an essay of mine in there and then some translations. Um, there was a, a famous controversy in the um, 1940s over the new theology. Um, and it really it, it was in the background of everyone's mind when you get to the Second Vatican Council. And so Dr. John Kerwin and myself uh, have worked uh, quite a bit on, we were going to do a volume of both sides of the debate, but then we got preempted by another author who was working on something. That's fine. So we ended up publishing all of the Dominican texts. Um, and it's, wow. I, I find it to be talk about fulfilling what you owe to your parents. It's like fulfilling what I owe to my parents intellectually. Um, you know, I've done all this Garagou stuff, and he's the one who's most infamous. But there were a lot of young Dominicans over in Toulouse, France, who were writing and trying to say that it's great to go back to the fathers. It's great to do to even be aware of the, the contemporary pastoral issues, but we need to avoid being too quick at doing it. We don't want to be too eager to just merely, you know, snap up existentialism and Marxism and, and kind of run with it. Um, so uh, the texts are they're they're not as they're not as nasty as people have historically made them out to be. The normal thing to do historically has been to say that Father Garrigou de Grange and Father Labradat and others were very dismissive to the their Jesuit brethren. And uh, we put together translations of basically all of their texts along with a historical overview. And our reviewers commented they were they were pleasantly surprised at how not polemic the introduction was. We're not wow. trying to to create you know a new upsurge. Uh, but it's a kind of my last my last moment with Garrigou uh, and my last moment with the, the, you know, maybe my first moment with some of those men from Toulouse to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to do good by them, to show, you know, that this is really the, the other side of that story. But the big exciting one is the revelation text with the mass. Uh, Cause that's huge. It's like 600,000 words, 700,000 words. Wow. Uh, it's a huge text. He, it was based on his course that father Garrigou Lagrange used to teach. Um, and it's just, we keep thinking we're done with it. And then there's one more thing about the cover or this or that. Um, it's just a, a big project like that's hard to hard to deal with. Um, but in order to get my second obligatory plugin, um, so you can, however, get this work, which is not academic, right? That is ex very accessible. I think, I mean, you're not just pitching it. That's what I meant uh, to do is to make it very, very accessible. I think even yeah. less technical than our discussion here today. Um, and yet inspired by the technicality. So it's not just kind of, you know, quote unquote, dumbed down or something. It's made communicable to everybody. Uh, and you go to ascensionpress.com slash Catholic morality to get it. And we do have the link right down there below, right down there. In P and, and I will also, once this airs, the link will also be, uh, they'll be able to click the link. It'll appear right there in the video where they can click it, go directly to the, to the page and order it. 
And uh, for the audience to know, I do, we do plan to do another show in the future, God willing, on Garigou Lagrange and many other shows, God willing, I do plan, uh, provided our schedules uh, allow us to do it as soon as possible, but we'll definitely do more material together. Dr. Miner, thank you so much for your time today. It has been a blessing to be being able to be here with you and talk with you. I look forward to talking to you again in the future, brother. It'll be great. Thanks for having me on, William. Thank you.